John Damaris, the Director of Operations for Civil Air Patrol. And uh, this morning, myself and two of my staff officers, uh, Eric Templeton, my Senior Program Manager for Operations Training, and Austin Worcester, my Senior Program Manager for Small UAS Operations, as well as Aeronet, are going to provide you an overview of our imagery collection capabilities for pre-event response and recovery uh, in support of the, uh, the NAPSIC conference, the Inspire conference. So we're looking forward to briefing you here this morning, and then we'll uh, jump right into it. So let me share my screen. And it, let's it press ahead. It, uh, Civil Air Patrol it has it, uh, three congressional missions. We're going to focus on the first one here today of emergency services. Uh, it, it, you'll probably know us primarily for search and rescue and disaster relief, but Civil Air Patrol actually has a lot of other missions that it supports. Uh, a lot of homeland security, drug interdiction, and kind of drug operations. We also do a lot of support for other uh, Air Force programs like Air Force ROTC and Junior ROTC. Uh, and they support a lot of missions behind the scenes that you not, may not be aware of. And we'll cover some of those here today for you. Uh, uh, also part of our mission is uh, we run a cadet program. Uh, I'm actually a former Civil Air Patrol cadet myself, and the, the CP cadet program uh, really uh, gets our cadets involved in aviation from the beginning, but is very similar to a lot of other youth programs like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, it provides a lot of leadership and character development, it has a physical fitness program. But something for you to be aware of is that our cadets are also actively involved in our emergency services and operational missions too. And our cadets range in age from 12 years old until they turn 21. So some of them may be older than some of the adults in the military that you may be dealing with, ironically. And then they, we also have an aerospace education mission. Civil Air Patrol that, uh, provides aerospace education training to our cadets, uh, as well as to our adult members. And then we also have external outreach programs reaching out to teachers and the general public and do things operationally with them, like teacher orientation flights, as well as providing a lot of hands-on activities that for uh, cadets and youth to uh, get them engaged in aviation. Civil Air Patrol has been around since December 1st of 1941, and our missions are it, uh, it, uh, have really not changed a lot over the years uh, in terms of the, the types of missions that we do, but obviously the tools and resources have changed dramatically over the years. Civil Air Patrol is actually a, a, a part of the total force for the Air Force, uh, and, they, and they, we actually became a part of the Air Force as the auxiliary of the Air Force in 1948. Uh, but they were actually a nonprofit charter by Congress in a traditionally day to day. Uh, and they, you know, all of these core missions that have been around for a long time for us, but they have really changed. Uh, when you look at our missions today, they, the resources that we're using have changed a lot over the last couple of decades. You know, we started fielding that uh, satellite digital imaging systems and being able to downlink it from handheld cameras from airplanes back in the early 2000s. Then we fielded hyperspectral imaging systems. Uh, we started uh, equipping airplanes with MX-15 sensors in 2009. Uh, we've actually they've been working with the uh, Jeep and Dart systems, which you'll learn a little bit more about here later in the briefing in 2010. Uh, and then we actually had wings start fielding FLIR systems in 2011, which we're gonna be putting a lot of them on airplanes across the country here over the next decade. Uh, we've been fielding the, uh, the verb kits for, for Nader collection since 2014, uh, and we've actually started fielding small UAS systems in 2015. And, uh, Austin will tell you a little bit about those here later in the presentation as well. Uh, it, and it hasn't stopped there. In 2018, we started fielding uh, strut mounted portable pod systems. In 2020, we started fielding ground mounted systems as well as uh, flying LIDAR on some small UAS. So, uh, you know, and it, this year and as we make, go forward, it's you can expect that there'll be more and more of its systems getting fielded. And this is really baseline capability for us is trying to make sure that we can capture imagery and deliver it for our customers. It, legally, the uh, our legal authorities that are that uh, under Title 36, that we actually that uh, serve as a nonprofit corporation that chartered by Congress. And then under Title 10, it, we serve as the auxiliary of the Air Force. So they, legally, we're always Civil Air Patrol as a nonprofit corporation. It, but under Title 10, it, uh, is when, when it, we're working most missions, which is about 80% of our flying time. And the, the resources that we are provided under Title 10 uh, are pretty vast. They, you know, they, we're the largest single owner of Cessna airplanes in the world. Uh, we're also the largest owner of gliders in the United States. And we've got 570 mid-powered airplanes, 47 gliders. We even have two hot air balloons. 
Uh, we've also got a ground vehicle fleet of over a thousand vehicles across the country. Uh, and then small UAS, we're probably the largest owner of small UAS in the United States of MIT. Uh, and they, you know, we may get eclipsed by the Amazons or the uh, some of the other delivery companies going forward. But for public safety UAS, we're probably going to be the largest for a long time. We've got over 2,000 small UAS in play, both for operational purposes as well as our educational programs. Uh, and then we also maintain a communications fleet that, uh, that's that, uh, about $35 million across the country. So pretty amazing capabilities supported by uh, over 54,000 members across the country. When you look at our airplanes, they're spread out across the country. You know, they're, obviously when you look at the map, there's some gaps out there. Right? Generally what we uh, advertise is that we can have an airplane overhead within about two hours of mission approval. Uh, and it, in anywhere in the United States. Uh, and those uh, airplanes are, are pretty vast, as we, we mentioned earlier. Uh, we are the, the largest single owner Cessna airplanes, as I mentioned, it, uh, but it's predominantly Cessna 182s in our fleet. Uh, and then we also have a, a large number of, it, of Cessna 172s. Uh, we've also got some Cessna 206s, primarily in, it, in mountainous it, in terrains, but we do have some in, it, in every region across the country. Uh, and then we, we've also got Gippsland GA8s. So we've got several of them in Alaska, as well as spread out uh, across the United States and, and the continental United States. Uh, and then we also have a, a few uh, uh, airplanes that are kind of specialized. And we have the Cessna 185s up in Alaska that are, as you can see in this picture, we have them equipped for floats. And in the wintertime, we actually have them equipped for skis. Uh, and then the, the malls are primarily a, a glider tow aircraft. Uh, so lots of capabilities across the, the country for our airplanes. Uh, and they, I'm going to pass you over to Eric Templeton here now to, to go into some of our uh, imagery capabilities. Hi, this is Eric Templeton. Uh, uh, covering aspects of uh, items that can be carried in the aircraft and or used and deployed in the field for uh, emergency response or post-emergency recovery response activities. The first on that list. Um, shell uh, camera systems. That's a, traditionally a Nikon camera system uh, that is being uh, taken oblique pictures outside the window, uh, damage assessment, um, and that can be done after a tornado, after a storm passage, after her, or after during hurricane response. Uh, we also have Nader cameras, uh, verbs and GoPros that can be hung off of the wing and give us a straight down view. Those can be used uh, for either immediate damage assessment or later um, mosaic together for uh, application. I should have mentioned that we have uh, a little over 600 uh, of those cameras out in the field across the country, uh, equipped or located, co-located with the aircraft that John showed you just a minute ago. Uh, the next system to discuss is uh, DART, um, uh, Domestic Awareness and Assessment Package. We're an integral part of a team player. Uh, we ride on the National Guard backbone. Uh, our ability to do uh, to play in that allows the Joint Operating Center or the JOC to be able to talk directly to the crew. The crew can provide near real time uh, video imagery from the aircraft and uh, airborne audio uh, and you know obviously the mark one eyeball uh, reviews of the activity that's going on in the area and get that information directly back to the jock improving situational awareness for the team we employ uh, Waldo Air camera pods currently. Uh, that's what's imaged here. We have a couple of different vendors uh, coming on board as well later in the year that provide this same type of camera. These are very high resolution, um, 50 megapixel cameras times two in this specific pod. And we use those to be able to create a, a mosaic and allow that to then be post-processed into uh, damage assessment and, and other things that can then be hosted and provided out to the GIS systems. Um, this pulls CAP not only uh, a, you know in the normal thought of let's send CAP in, it's an emergency, go take pictures, do damage assessment. It also extends our footprint into operations well into the recovery process for monitoring of uh, removal of uh, debris, trash, and, and recovery processes, uh, rebuilding and, and structural work that can be imaged and then compared digitally uh, and monitored by the, uh, uh, the federal agencies involved or local agencies as well. That high resolution collect looks like this. Um, the left side of the screen shows you the area that was collected, a zoom in on a specific building showing the kind of detail that you can see. And I'll point out things like you can see the structure of telephone poles, you can see the trees that are there, you can see the VA 
vehicles. That that gives you a pretty good sense of the level of detail of the imagery that can be presented here. And you can, you know, not knowing the orientation of the photo right off the bat, but by looking at it, you can say it's probably mid to late afternoon because of the angle of the shadows that you're even seeing. Uh, as we click into the next one, this one's 3D, and I'm not going to be able to do the, the pull around on this, but this is a 3D reconstruction of that same entity that you just saw in the 2D view, uh, but literally because the aircraft has flown circles over this entire area, we're able to image each of the sides. Now, obviously some distortion present and a few other things, but this is pretty amazing because we can actually, uh, through the math that the computer can do, look at those debris piles and estimate their size and help FEMA with that process of, of recovery, which is cleaning up afterwards, right? Getting all that trash, debris, and other things out of the way, along with being able to look at each and every one of these buildings and do a very good damage assessment process Process, visually if you want to look at them or automated through uh, uh, artificial intelligence. We can fly over uh, uh, public areas. We can also fly over military bases and installations. Here's an image from uh, from Tyndall as well. Uh, obviously those have to be coordinated, but that, that process can be handled in both locations. Here's an image of the uh, Arkansas tornado that was done and very specifically showing the artificial intelligence employed for damage assessment. Uh, totally destroyed uh, uh, buildings in purple, uh, significant damage in orange, some damage in yellow and what appears to be no damage in green is very, very quick now for the uh, incident commander at the uh, state EOC or, or parish uh, um, operations center to be able to look at things and say, what, what, what did we just experience? In this case, in a very focused area where a tornado's at, in the cases of uh, hurricane, uh, imagery was done of the entire uh, city of Lake Charles Louisiana to, to estimate and understand the amount of damage that was uh, uh, inflicted. On the uh, our, um, our RPA side of the house, we have uh, aircraft that are equipped with uh, um, uh, balls to simulate exactly what would be done for training in the field, and that allows us to act as a safe platform for the trainees when they're uh, practicing the air, uh, use of the ball in the field. Uh, the MX-15, which is on the next screen, is the ball that's on our, uh, on our planes. The imagery types that you've got with that narrow image, the wide angle image, day and infrared, those lenses are the same lenses and the same activity that that training officer would experience if they were flying the actual aircraft with this ball attached. Um, this gives them a safe operating environment gets the folks on the ground that we're interoperating with that uh, sensor ball operator uh, and allows uh, training to be handled um, with an aircraft that doesn't require special operation requirements like if an actual drone was up doing the work. John, back to you. Thanks, Eric, and we'll hit transition over to Austin Worcester for the next section here. Hello, everybody. My name is Austin Worcester, and I am the Senior Program Manager for Unmanned Systems in the Aeronet Program at CAP Headquarters. As <clears throat> Moose and Eric uh, discussed, we are fielding several different uh, applications for imagery. And one of those is the, unex the inexpensive small UAS application. Everything from the $2,500 Skydio Pro uh, all the way up to the, the $30,000, $35,000 more advanced UAVs like the uh, Skydio X2D or the Event 38 E386 fixed wing aircraft. And we do this to provide that much higher level of resolution. <clears throat> when we're using the Waldo X cam, uh, we get, you know, down to about half an inch uh, to an inch per pixel. Uh, with our aircraft in the UAV world, we're getting down to, in some cases, as low as a tenth of a, a centimeter per pixel, which allows that much higher level of uh, information that you can get. Plus, it can be overlaid on top of the, the Waldo XCAM data, and that gives you even that higher level of resolution in that inside that solution for the AI to do its um, damage assessment. Or when you're down as low as that one-tenth per centimeter per pixel, you can even look at the rivets of a bridge and say, this bridge is, is good or something has shifted. Um, it allows that higher level of critical infrastructure inspection. Image we, that we get uh, with our UAVs is we're, we're taking those and we're merging them into an ortho mosaic. And what we're doing is georectifying them 
um, or in some cases they are truly geolocated. Um, but the example you're seeing on the screen is an eight acre site. It's our training area at Camp Atterbury. Uh, this is where we conduct our National Emergency Services Academy um, each year. And this is about 300 images taken over a nine minute period of time. They were stitched together using um, off the shelf common software. We use everything from Esri Site Scan to Pix4D to Metashape. Um, there are a multitude of processes out there that you can use to process these images. Once they get it, um, Ortho Mosaic together, they're looking at it and then they're geo rectifying it against known locations. We do have the capability to do RTK processing to get us within that two centimeter circle of error when it comes to uh, geo rectification. And all of this was done in less than two hours. So you can take that, it's now a TIFF file, and you can drop it into any GIS platform Falcon View, ArcGIS are the most common. Um, that are in use in our world. And now you can compare to what was there when the um, GIS platform image was taken, whether it's Google Earth or whatever. And now you're seeing what is there in near real time. Uh, we have some other solutions that are coming down the pike that give you into that almost instantaneous to real time. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But this gets you that high detail for infrastructure review. Um, also allows you to do pre-incident planning and pre-event planning with our equipment. We also support, you know, Air Force missions and other uh, Homeland Security targets of opportunity, air defense intercept targets. Um, this is a recent incident that occurred where an aircraft um, with a foreign military student pilot and a, a U.S. first assignment instructor pilot crashed about 300 yards short of the approach end of the runway at Montgomery Regional Airport. It's a major regional airport, um, and this was an active runway. And so we flew UAS at roughly 75 feet altitude to get that one tenth of a centimeter per pixel to help the accident investigators get their data to determine and help determine what happened. Um, one of the things that we actually did fly fixed wing aircraft over this as well. Um, but because this is an active regional airport, uh, commercial heavy traffic is coming in and out, and it does make uh, coordinating with the airport complicated. And we were able to do that um, with our teams working with the TRACON and with the, uh, the tower in concert so that we weren't interfering with the airport's operation. At the same time, we were helping the Air Force Safety Board make some determinations. For example, in this case, this is the approach end, the accident sites just off to your left, about 300 yards from the from that first tower in your view as to what the pilot likely saw just before the incident. We put it at what we estimated was the cockpit altitude um, and what the runway should have looked like on a normal approach. If you'll note on the right, this is the image that was taken right at the time um, the incident occurred so that you get all of the visual distractors involved. The, the one on the left was taken with optimum lighting conditions uh, almost at midday. The one on the right was taken right at uh, the minute the incident um, is believed to have occurred to help give a, a better picture of what the pilot may or may not have seen. One of the other capabilities we're adding is the, using a car mounted Waldo camera, much like the Google 360 camera, to give this ground level 360 degree view of um, our site. So we're one of those few agencies that can take ground level imagery, either from a standard um, Esri Survey123 app, we can use the Waldo X cam on the ground level in a 360 degree method. We can use UAV imagery from surface to 400 feet above ground level or up 400 feet above a particular building if that building is in excess of 400 feet. 
then we can go to our standard um, oblique imagery at a thousand feet AGL, all the way up to our standard um, Waldo X cam, which is typically done at about 2,500 feet above ground level. Merge all of those images together, and now you have a very good comprehensive package of what is actually going on on the ground. Helps us determine debris pile size, helps FEMA decide how many vehicles they need to, dump trucks they need to haul this stuff off. What kind of access do you have into that disaster zone? Uh, critical infrastructure inspection, is that bridge still aligned up the way it's supposed to be? Is that power substation still standing the way it's supposed to be? We were enabled to play all of these together and saturate um, Southern Puerto Rico immediately post earthquake. Our UAVs were the um, primary team involved in that first week because weather conditions grounded our fixed wing operations and frequent aftershocks were making it dangerous to go up and down streets where we could stand off in a clear field with a UAV and overfly these areas. And our UAVs were not affected by the, the high winds that were buffeting the island at that particular time. One of our new technologies, it's also another program I'm running is uh, the Aeronet. And it's actually stands for the Airborne Extensible Relay Over the Horizon Network. It is a tactical aerial network that allows us to take um, a mesh radio system that has a computer-based system on it and move data through SMS texting, voice over IP, legacy radio systems over IP, which means you can roip in your um, legacy radio system, your public safety radio, or an aircraft radio, and transmit it over the C, the L band, or the S band. And this multiple chain mesh radio system is self-healing and self-forming. So the more radios in the system, the better it, it performs, the quicker it performs. But if we lose a radio suddenly off of that, there's no single point of failure in the system. It is a self-healing mesh network. Um, it's an ad hoc network too. So there is no single controlling radio. All of the radios act as a controller. These radios are operating on a Linux operating system with an Android operating system over top of it. And so the radio itself has a video encoder. It's an Android device, computing device, um, and we're using the uh, TAC or ATAC software, depending on your familiarity with it, um, to provide that tactical awareness, allowing all of our users to see with our dismounted kit that's vest mounted. Um, it has a camera mounted to the back of the end user device. Uh, so it's transmitting um, video in 1080p. The vehicle kits have a mounted camera transmitting in 1080p. And the aircraft has a handheld kit or can use a sensor ball if it has a sensor ball. All of that transmitting and all of, everybody can see each other's video. And all of this can be then relayed from the ground to the air back to a tracking antenna up to 100 nautical miles away. And this creates these little bubbles of uh, infrastructure independent internet that's closed. It's more of an infrastructure infranet as opposed to an internet. But what makes it capable even more than that is we can tie a one of these MPU5 radios into the internet and one of our teams or customers hundreds of miles away from uh, the tracking antenna can now see this information directly over uh, the internet being streamed straight to them and they can participate in the mission just as if they were sitting next to the team um, in the field. This is actually an Air Force program. It's intended for foreign military sales. The whole concept of the project was to provide uh, interoperable communications with our partner nations in the um, Southern Cone, uh, South America Cone of Influence, where we don't have to give them access to classified information. This is all commercial off the shelf technology that's encrypted with bank level security. So it's secure but we're not giving them information on classified systems. Uh, what we're doing now with this is expanding it into uh, humanitarian and disaster relief operations to give our customers that real-time information um, in real-time communications. So our customer can talk directly to our air crew in the air and say, hey, I, I need to see this with a sensor ball. Uh, can you look at that with the infrared? 
or hey, ground guy, can you just turn you know, 90 degrees to your right and let me look at this? And that gives you that interoperable tactical communications. So it is a developing technology. CAP has the largest system in the world of this um, right now. And our assignment for helping develop this actually came from the Air Force Chief of Staff, um, General Goldfein at the time, now General Brown, um, who is, is quite supportive of us continuing in this. And so we're working in concert with the Air Force Special Operations Command and the uh, continued light attack experiment uh, with Air Combat Command to help develop the system and make it a deployable asset, um, not just in the civilian world, but in the military world. So from an operational perspective, this gives you a better uh, perspective of ideal things. While we can go out uh, to 130 nautical miles, um, our data range at 100 miles is 10 megabits per second. Uh, if we go out to 130 nautical miles, it actually lowers to about five uh, megabits per second which we don't typically notice much unless we're streaming multiple streams of video. Um, so the airborne node can communicate with ground crews as much as 40 um, nautical miles away. And that aircraft can then transmit directly back to the, the C2 or EOC node uh, up to 100 miles away, but we can also go aircraft to aircraft 40 miles distance. So we can continue to build out. The idea is that we're dropping that C2 node in that area that is not infrastructure denied or internet denied, uh, but our aircraft are operating over a disaster site that may be internet denied, uh, and getting that information directly from our field crews right back to you in real time. We can also pull these HD um, 1080p videos. We can take still images and move them as well, which gives you that higher definition. In the phase two, we're, we're building this system across the entire uh, southern Gulf Coast and the southern half of the Atlantic uh, seaboard. The intent was is that with three aircraft and one C2 node and, you know, give or take 15 or 20 ground nodes, uh, dismounted kits, we can saturate the entirety of the U.S. Virgin Islands and um, Puerto Rican territory and provide that you know, blanket internet support with data and information moving back and forth, all to that uh, EOC or initial operating facility for FEMA. Uh, we maintain a deployable kit of three uh, tracking antennas so that we can drop one at an EOC, one at our incident command post, and one at the uh, FEMA IOS, IOF to allow them to, to be able to exchange information all at the same time. Plus, we can add uh, units into that field uh, through the through normal internet all the way back to the United States. Um, I'm going to kick this back over to Mr. Damaris now and allow him to to keep going with what we have in operations. Thanks. Thanks, Austin. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, let me you know, go ahead and hit, uh, put my hit slides back up here. All right. And so, uh, you know, that probably one of the, the biggest things uh, for Civil Air Patrol is its people, though. They, you know, we bring a lot of resources to bear for uh, operational missions, but we uh, we also bring uh, thousands of volunteers and from across the country. And yes, we're Civil Air Patrol, so we do have a lot of pilots and aircrew members, but we actually have a lot of people that have gotten involved uh, across the board in running missions, and they all train to the, uh, the federal standards. Uh, making sure that they meet the national incident management system requirements and training, uh, and they, they they literally come from all walks of life. And, they, uh, and, they, and we've got people that are trained as section chiefs and incident commanders, as well as net information officers, safety staff, communications people, uh, chaplains, you name it. We've got folks that are supporting our missions across the board. Uh, operationally, uh, we hadn't discussed this. They, uh, we actually work from border to border and then coast to coast across the continental United States, as well as in Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We actually have 52 wings, the 50 states plus the national capital in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands is one combined wing. Uh, and just so you understand how we operate, generally, if we're supporting a federal agency, we have to do that as the Air Force Auxiliary. 
Uh, the rest of the time, we can support as Civil Air Patrol, so supporting state and local entities. It is generally done in a corporate status initially, and then when there's a federal interest, in it, it gets done as the Air Force Auxiliary. And to do Air Force signed missions, it has to be approved by the Air Component Commander. Most of the missions for Civil Air Patrol are approved by the first Air Force Commander, uh, or they can be approved by the, the PACAF the, uh, command staff uh, for uh, Alaska and Hawaii, uh, normally uh, done with their operations centers. And give you a, a picture of what we do in a typical year. It's typically about 60 to 80 percent of what's on First Air Force's daily sortie list across the country. So that we do a lot of flying for them. Uh, and in a typical year, CAP flies about 80,000 hours of Air Force side missions, and about 15 to 20,000 of those hours are in direct support of customers on the varied missions that we support. Uh, and there a few things on limitations for you so you understand. Uh, Civil Air Patrol is just like the, the military that, uh, it, as far as our operations go. Uh, so Posse Comitatus applies. And what does that mean to you? Well, uh, we can't be involved in search and seizure or arrest or interrogations or direct law enforcement activities. Uh, we do have some missions that we have some special approvals for to be able to work along the, the, the border operations. But either way, if the military generally can't do it within the United States, then we can't. And it, uh, even though in some cases the National Guard can do some law enforcement operations, uh, Civil Air Patrol, though legally we could, we have chosen not to commit to do that in order to not put our members at risk. Uh, so we limit those kinds of missions. So uh, when you look at our uh, overall benefit, probably one of the biggest benefits is that we're cost effective. You know, it's it's better to use an airplane like ours that's fairly inexpensive to operate than some of the other larger assets out there. And we're pretty well equipped, that, as you've seen, that we've got a lot of that, uh, resources getting fielded that, that really that in the past had only been fielded on high end military aircraft. Uh, and now we're able to do a lot of those missions and allow them to be used for the missions that are they're better suited for. Uh, day to day, that how do you get us? Well, you can submit requests that through the the normal that on uh, the defense that process. But generally, day to day, the easiest thing is that to have the request that go that uh, to, through the Air Force for approval. Uh, the Air Force can uh, approve uh, just about all of our missions uh, directly. Uh, it makes it for a much faster approval. And those requests go through our National Operations Center. Our CAP National Operations Center is located at Maxwell Air Force Base uh, in Alabama uh, and is uh, available 24-7. Uh, it's manned during the normal duty day and then rolls to a duty officer after hours that uh, so that we recommend that actually calling our national operations center and that when you have an emergency request uh, rather than just sending an email uh, and that you know emails are great but uh, and that, uh, giving somebody a heads up is probably the, the best thing to do and realize day to day for most of our missions we would remain under military operation control late, uh, when it's done as an air force signed mission uh, so we don't just chop to another agency uh, the Civil Air Patrol always remains in that, uh, that function and format. And bottom line, in the end here, uh, it CAP's ready and willing to help. And we've got volunteers from all walks of life and uh, professionals that uh, really are willing to help. And we do a lot of different missions day to day. We cover just a few here today. Uh, and we hope that uh, you appreciate all the things that we can do for you. And uh, going forward, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, just reach out to, uh, to me, John Damaris. Uh, Eric Templeton that, uh, or Austin uh, and our email addresses are here. Uh, so feel free to uh, reach out to us if you have any questions about our programs and they will be uh, glad to help you uh, and have a great day.